All right, uh, good evening and welcome everybody to the 2018 School Board Candidate Forum. Um, sponsored by the Composure Education Center PTA, and my name is Joanna Kahn. I will be moderating this evening, and uh, I am the current secretary for the PTA. I want to thank you guys all for being here this, uh, tonight, and we are recording the forum, so please be sure to speak into your microphone. The forum will be available on the district website uh, later on this week. So before we begin, I will describe the general format for tonight's forum. <coughs> Candidates will begin with a minute and a half opening statement, introducing themselves and articulating why you are running for the school board. That will be followed by a response to a question they've all received in advance. We will then pose two general topic questions for all of the candidates to answer. Next will be the lightning round, where each candidate will receive one randomly drawn question. And finally, we will pose one last question for all candidates to answer. As time permits, we will take additional questions submitted from members of our audience today. And if any audience members would like to ask a question, there are index cards available and pens. And um, if you want to write down your question, um, Susan or Elena, I don't know, Susan will be um, passing out those cards and then collecting them so that I can ask those questions of the candidates. Just make sure that when you uh, address those questions that they are for all of the questions, all, all of the candidates and not one in particular. Throughout the forum, we will rotate the order in which the candidates respond to questions. So initially, I'll call on Linda first, and then we'll start with Christy, etc. To get through the prepared questions and allow for audience questions, we will limit response time. Time allotments will be announced before each round of questions. Uh, Jenny Koch here is our timekeeper time keeper today, and she will signal you with a orange, yellow, or red card, just showing you how much time is left to answer that question. Given the number of candidates, I ask that you all try to stay within the constraints <coughs> of the questioning. Finally, for everyone in, in attendance, just remember that this is not a debate, this is a forum and all candidates have the opportunity to share their views with the voting public. To that end, we ask that everyone in the audience please be respectful of the ground rules of the forum. Any outbursts, including clapping, shouting, or heckling, will not be tolerated. Individuals responsible for such interruptions will be asked to leave. We thank everybody for your cooperation, and we look forward to hearing the views of all of our candidates tonight. So we will begin with an opening statement from each of the candidates. Each of you get 90 seconds to respond. So beginning with Linda, please tell us a bit about yourself and why you are running for the school board. Sure, hi everybody. Um, my name is Linda Diaz. I have, oh, you can see that I talk loud enough, I didn't even need this. Um, my name is Linda Diaz and uh, I lived in South St. Paul my whole life. I took a, a little detour when I went to UMD for 10 years, um, but came back to raise my son, who's in the audience, it's real. Mm -hmm. He's here in third grade. Um, I am a mental health therapist by trade. Um, my whole career has been working with kids and families in the school districts, actually. Um, I have about 22 years um, experience working in the school district and with kids and really getting to know how schools operate, um, how families and communities are a part of those schools, and really that feel of um, how families like to feel when they're in their school. Um, of course, I had it all prepared and it's gone now. Um, <laughs> Going first. Um, what else? Uh, I said that I've lived here. I'm raising my son here. He actually comes to Kaposha School here. Um, why am I running? I'm running because I feel like I have a lot to offer from the mental health perspective, especially everything that's been happening in uh, the communities um, and communities of color. So I'm getting the hook. Um, but thank you. 
That's a lot of pressure. Um, good evening, my name is Christy Hood, and I am one of the incumbents that is running for uh, this position this election cycle. Uh, my husband Dennis and I uh, have lived here for about 22 years. Our middle and youngest child uh, both attended South St. Paul schools and have since graduated and headed off to the University of Minnesota. Um, I really at no point in my life thought that I would ever run for any sort of political office. My dad held a political office and as a kid. I, I fully understood the challenges and that sometimes people could be mean and um, you had to be a little thick-skinned and I thought that I would never even run for something like library board. But after um, having my kids involved in school and starting like many of the parents here tonight and being involved in our, uh, our PTA and um, as time went on and the more we got involved with our school system and our um, you know kids activities and you know it really came to fruition realizing that if you have an opportunity to serve you should serve and that's exactly what I would tell my kids now um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity that our community has given me so far and uh, if uh, if anyone feels like that I've done a good job and it would like they would like me to stay in this position um, I'm, I would be grateful to continue uh, with my role. And uh, I really want to thank the PTA for hosting the event tonight. Good evening, everyone. Joya, Jenny, and the Composure PTA, thank you for um, holding this forum. I see Principal uh, Brito in the background, and um, Composure has always been that school that stepped up to um, manage these events, and certainly we appreciate it. Um, my name is Ann Cunahan. Schultz is my maiden name. I had to spend a lot of money to get rid of that name for those of you that know me uh, as a Schultz. Um, I have lived in this community my whole life. I am uh, married to 25 years to the same person. His name is Ryan and I don't share this very often but after 25 years I feel comfortable in saying he is from Wisconsin. <laughs> I, uh, work on the campus at the University of Minnesota for Gopher Athletics, a position I like very, very much, and a lot of my time is spent there. Uh, I like watching, attending, playing sports. I also like going to the cabin. We have three children. All three have graduated. The one that our youngest most recently is a, recently she's a freshman at UMD. She graduated in the spring. Our two older daughters are um, employed or in grad school gainfully. I'm pleased to be here. I'm running because it is uh, in my blood to serve and to serve this community is what I'd love to do. Well, good evening. Uh, I'm Chris Walker. I also would like to echo the, my thanks for uh, having this forum put on. It's a, a good opportunity for us to share our views and, and what we're, why we're running the school board. I have been a resident of South St. Paul for 29 and a half years and I've been around up to 30. Uh, my wife Connie and I raised two children who are both graduates of South St. Paul High School. Uh, I have 30 plus years in the financial industry. Uh, four years ago when I ran for school board I said it was because the school district had served our family so well that I wanted to give back. That reason still sticks. Um, in those four years I have gained a lot of experience. Uh, I've spent the last two years as the school board chair. I have three plus years as our liaison to the Association of Metropolitan School Districts, including two years on their legislative committee that made up the legislative uh, um, priorities that we've passed on to the, the state government. Um, so that it, that, that's the second reason, in addition to just wanting to give back, that reason is still there. Uh, but I want to be able to apply the experience and the relationships that I've made over those four years um, and, and continuing on with some of the programs uh, that we have implemented and uh, are being successful with in the school. So again, thanks for coming tonight. And we'll pass it on. Good. <coughs> Excuse me. Good evening. My name is Monica Weber. And not to sound like a broken record, but I will echo um, the appreciation for hosting um, this forum tonight. Um, my husband and I live on the northern end of town by the Northview Pool. Um, we have lived in the community for seven years and chose to live um, in this community. I have a um, bachelor's degree in social studies, secondary education, where I received a teaching degree, and then I have a master's degree in advocacy and leadership from the University of Minnesota. 
I currently am a grant specialist at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, where I administer um, the financial end of the grants, mostly from the Legacy Fund, from the, from the Outdoor Heritage Fund. And I am running because I'm relatively new, I know in South St. Paul terms, um, <laughs> to this community, but I chose to live in this community because I wanted to be a part of of the community and because I wanted to be a part of the schools, I wanted to be a part of, you know, the activities and extracurriculars that were that were going on. I was in Bye Bye Birdie by the South St. Paul Community Theater this last year. Um, and I'm running for the school board because it's, the formula does not work, it is not fair, and we need to have more advocates the legislature reflecting those needs that every child in Minnesota should have an equal opportunity to an equal education, and we need to fix the formula. Good evening, my name is Wendy Woods Felton. I also am a lifelong resident of South St. Paul. I actually grew up right across the street. As Mr. Bretoy can attest, my mom kind of babysits the, the playground for him. Um, <laughs> I'm a graduate of, graduate of the class of 75 and I'm also graduated of Andrew Hills Community College. I am a mother of three South St. Paul graduates and a grandmother of five, three of who have attended South St. Paul elementary schools. I am asking your support as I seek another term on the school board. I currently serve as your clerk secretary, which I'm very proud to have that position on our board. Uh, I have a very vast history of working with youth in our community in South St. Paul, and this gives me a great opportunity to give back to this community just some of the things that they've given to me and my family. One of the reasons that I chose to run on the board initially so many years ago is I felt that I brought a new perspective to the school board. As a single parent raising three kids on my own, I knew the struggles that families in this community face. As a, as a single parent, as a one person income, raising your kids on your own, transportation issues, childcare issues, I felt like I could really offer a good perspective to our board and to our community with those, with those things. So, and again, thank you to the PTAs for sponsoring this event, and I look forward to your support in two weeks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bill Arend, and uh, I'm a lifelong resident of South St. Paul as well as a graduate of South St. Paul, uh, as was my mother, as was my grandmother, as were my family, and my grandchildren are still here. So we're here to stay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the people that have filed for school board. After reading your bios, you're all very capable and you'll certainly have my support. And I'd like to thank the folks out there that have taken the time to listen to what we have to say. Um, I think I'm gonna start real quick by saying, my wife taught here from 1969 until 2008. My son started teaching here in 1996 and is still on the staff. So we do have a vested interest in the community. Um, instead of saying how long I'm a resident, I'm gonna say I'm a resident of the house I live in for 43 years. And uh, if anybody's interested in your mind, the Lincoln Center, there's a uh, bull that says South St. Paul Packer Pride in a story, and I would like to have you visit it, and I'll tell you the story. Um, the reason I ran originally was because last time we had we were short of people and I wanted to make sure everybody had a choice. But then I remember my VISTA training in Nome, Alaska, where they said if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I don't want to be part of the problem and my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, thank you to the PTA uh, for uh, hosting this event. It's really and for all of you to, uh, for coming as well to the candidates for um, being here and being a part of this. My name is Cara Beckman. I have lived here for 13 years, so I also am on the new end as these things are measured in South St. Paul. Um, I, cut, I grew up in rural Minnesota, moved to the cities for uh, college, uh, lived overseas for a couple of years, and then um, came back here and my husband and I bought a house. I have one of those complicated families that's not easy to um, talk about in the soundbite, but have had three uh, kids in the school district here and had one who graduated two years ago and have a current student here in fourth grade at Kaposia. 
Um, and have another uh, a stepdaughter who really struggled in school and is 18 years old and working on a GED. Um, and that perspective really matters in thinking about, you know, our schools really are amazing and they can be even more amazing for even more people. So how do we look at the margins and see what else is going on and how we can continue to improve. Um, I work at the University of Minnesota. I work in the medical school in a center for youth development, um, where we're really dedicated to understanding what those developmental tasks of childhood and adolescence are, and how our communities and structures and systems can really support those so that all of our students can thrive um, as they uh, go on to emerging adulthood and um, their next steps in life. Good evening, my name is Kathy Delsing. Um, this is my second time trying to run for the school board, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am currently running for the simple fact that, number one, yes, we didn't have enough people to run on one of the terms, but mostly because I have a student that's in 10th grade, and I have two children that are now graduates of Salsa and Call. And the biggest thing for me right now is to make sure that we follow through with the safety of our students and with the $500,000 grant that we received, we can only get better with the safety for those that are in the secondary building. Um, I have been a resident to Minnesota my whole life, saw St. Paul my whole life of four generations of my family. And I just want to see the generations of children to come to have the education they deserve and just get better and better. Um, I'm not sure what else I can tell you other than I'm happy to be here and thank you for hosting. Thank you to all the candidates for your intro. I just wanted to mention uh, we are missing one candidate. Uh, Marjorie Stewart was not able to be here tonight uh, due to his uh, being out of town. So I just wanted the audience to recognize that Marjorie is not here, unfortunately. We will go on to the next question, which is the uh, prepared question that you were all handed uh, or given last week. With, and we will begin with Christy and continue on down the line. With 10 candidates that vying for four seats, how are you differentiating yourself in this election? What unique abilities, experiences, passions, and vision distinguishes you from the other candidates. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say that clearly with this uh, panel, with our opening introductions, that we have a lot of highly qualified people here tonight. And um, I think that that is for the betterment of our community. And so I'm glad that everyone here has stepped forward and asked for the opportunity to serve. Uh, one way that I think that I would be able to best lend my support is that uh, given that I have now had four years of experience under my belt, um, I look back now and I remember my first year and a half, I barely uttered a word. There was so much to learn. Um, big, big budgets, um, you know, big policy, uh, and in amongst all of those big rocks, we had all these little tiny rocks that needed to be moved around and shuffled and, and uh, discussed and uh, properly put into their place and at times it seemed like I didn't know that I would ever learn everything that needed to be learned and the reality of it is is that we will not because it's it's ever evolving and ever changing so I would hope that my four years of experience would give me um, enough ground with which to continue with the good work that we've already started and to take uh, good hard looks at the things the challenges that we're still having and uh, that uh, my level-headedness and uh, calm under pressure will continue to help me make those decisions that are necessary. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, thank you for the question. So, I, I think to answer this question uh, effectively, I just want to um, harken back to two stories. One is my dad served on this school board for about 30 years, I think, when I was a kid. And I remember, gosh, Israel is probably his age, and I, I asked him, you know, why, why do you do this? Why, why do you serve on this board? And his, his response was, because there are a lot of kids whose parents can't help, and I need to be their voice. 
Um, I look forward to um, a, a recent time. My brothers and I, when our parents passed away, started a fund at the at the Education Foundation for students at the high school that had been unable to pay for their uh, extracurricular activity fees. It's called the Stride for Packer Pride. We just celebrated our 10th year and have helped about 350 families and have raised over $100,000 to go directly to students to pay for their fees. And it was about the seventh year and my daughter asked, how many more years are we gonna be doing this? And I said, I think um, until there's not a need. And I feel that I, the main reason that I'm here is to be that voice for those kids, those parents who, aren't, who are not here, those parents who can't effectively advocate for their kids. Someone needs to be there for them too. Um, and I feel that's uh, the purpose why I'm here tonight, why I'll be here in four years, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot to that question. Um, I did touch on my experience in my previous answer, so I think I'd like to go right to uh, my passions and most of all my vision. Uh, my vision as a school board member is for every graduate of South St. Paul to not only have a quality education when they leave, but also a career path. Um, I see a couple of the, the passions that will lead us to that. One is teaching every student at their own level. That's a difficult thing to take on. I think traditionally the, the schools have had a class of 30 and everybody's learning at the same level. And really it's much more effective to meet the kids you know, where they are. And that's a very difficult change to make. Our teachers have, have started the, the process of, of making that change and they're doing a fabulous job. If you walk through the schools now, you see that the, the kids are all working at their own level, the teachers working with some of them and not others. It's, it's a difficult change, but they're doing a great job. The other uh, piece of that is the, uh, the, the career path. And what I want is that for every graduate to have a plan for where they're going next. And we have programs in place, we're implementing more every year. They are leading them to that so that when they leave, they have an idea of what they want to do. And most of all, they have a plan. It, and that was, a, that was a challenging question. I was, you know, and thinking about, you know, the great variety of candidates that, that we have up here. I think that my skill set is being an advocate. It is really a, a value to this district. Um, the relationships I worked at the Capitol for several years, um, both as an advocate and as a legislative assistant, and I kind of, I believe, know how the system works down there. I think I can be the best advocate as a representative of this community to the legislature to again fight for changes like on the formula or on standards or on the various needs um, of our community. I also know that on my street alone, we sold five houses this summer and all five were families that were, you know, grandparents moving on to other housing options and in their place came young families, all brand new to this community, all with young children, we're all gonna be represented in our school district. And I also think that, you know, as a relatively newer resident of South St. Paul, that that's another group that I can connect to, that I can say welcome to this community, you are welcomed in this community, and we value you. And that is something that I also wanna to bring to the school board to represent all the brand new families in South St. Paul. Yes, the reason that I, I am seeking another term, this is my opportunity to give back. So many things have been given to me and to my family. As I mentioned earlier, as a single parent, I struggled day to day with issues that we all deal with. Um, and I was so fortunate to have a good support system raising my three children. And I, I said, I do have a strong history of, you, of volunteer service to the community. I was a Boy Scout leader for 13 years, serving in every position except for Scoutmaster. I was a Girl Scout leader for 12 years. My daughter earned the Silver Award, and, I, and my son is an Eagle Scout. I also taught religious education at St. Augustine's for six years, where I received the Excellence and Catechesis Award from Archbishop Flynn. These volunteer positions have been 
my lifeblood. It's what, what I live for, it's what I like to do. I raise my children to have strong values so that they will pass those on to their children someday. And I do look forward, hopefully, to serving another term to our families and our students. Um, I currently serve on several committees, as all current board members do. I've served on the Community Education Advisory Council, Central Square Board, <laughs> Finance Committee, Building Bond Committee, Educational Foundation Committee, and I currently serve on in Intermediate School Board 917 Board, and I will probably talk about that a little bit later in my speech. Thank you. <laughs> Um, let me start by saying uh, I came here with no agenda, I had no access to grind, and I want to talk about the specific skill that I have that will help the school board. I'm happy with the direction they're going and want to see it continue that and then going in that direction. Um, the one skill that I do have is I'm a team player. Uh, I could probably prove it by going back to my junior year in high school when we were the first hockey team to play for the state championship. And my senior year, we were third place in the state. Uh, I think I exhibited my teammate skills and my problem solving and the things that we need to keep going in the direction we're going. And um, I think I can, can I thank the rest of those seconds? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so when I think about a school board or a city council or whatever, I think about who are the different constituencies that are represented and it's, it's really fun to be able to be a part of a board or a council or to vote for a board or a council because you really get to look at the diversity um, and, and think about how they represent different um, groups in the community. And so I thought about that question from that perspective and thought who are the different constitu constituencies that I really want to represent that maybe I don't see on the school board right now. And so one of those is parents of current students. Um, there's a different urgency to uh, decision making and, um, and a different access to understanding what the results of a budgetary decision or a policy decision are when you have a child in a class um, and can really see those impacts. Um, the second was already mentioned, but the, you know, what is it like to move into this community? and um, Kind of understand that there's lots and lots of people who have been here for generations and how do we kind of open up what it means to be a member of the south st paul community to people who you know continue to be here and will continue to be here but also to people who are new and who it's our responsibility to really bring into this community and educate as well and then third the group of people who believe that learning is relational fundamentally um, Learning happens when relationships are strong, and safety happens when relationships are strong. Um, so, so that kind of fundamental belief around what the core is of um, that educational interaction. Well, the reason that I'm running is due to the fact that I do have a 10th grader. I do find that it would be important to have, as you said, parents, current parents, with students on the board. Um, not only elementary, but secondary. Um, you gotta bring fresh views from not only the board members, the community, the staff, but also the students. You gotta listen to them. You gotta be open to their communication. And they're, they're smart. We are South St. Paul. We are proving that they, we do have smart children. They know what they need. Um, they are communicating that to us every day. A fresh view on that, maybe that would be a, a good avenue to go down. Um, I also have fresh ideas from working with the Supreme Court on how security would work with the Supreme, uh, with the South St. Paul Secondary Schools. Um, I, I just feel that the whole board does need a fresh view on what's coming for the future. We don't want to hold the kids back, but the future is what they need. Thanks. Um, I agree with all that's been said, and I, I do really like the point about um, honoring our elders, honoring the history of South St. Paul, but also really understanding what is coming next. And you know, when I think about the demographics of this town, and you know, when I grew up, I was one of a very few families of color 
that were here um, and how we were treated, um, the, the interactions that we had, which were very, very minimal. You know, and if we look at the audience today to make sure that we are representing all the families of South St. Paul, um, not just a certain aspect, and making sure that, that our school board looks like the families that we're, we're representing. So that really, for me, was the very first item um, on my agenda. I, I really didn't even think about being a parent um, until some other folks had talked about it because, you know, I think I am very vocal, um, and I also believe that um, we are, the school board has to be a liaison from the community to the schools and back. We have to be that bridge. And if we're not approachable, if we're not um, visible, then that doesn't happen. So uh, to be able to have folks who aren't afraid to go into the community, who aren't afraid to ask questions and have people um, approach you wherever you are, and I know that happens a lot to the folks who are on the current board, um, you know, that, that to me that's what um, being on the board means. Thanks. Thank you all again. Our next question uh, is a general topic question. You will get 90 seconds to answer the question and we will begin with Anne. Thank you. I guess you need the question. <laughs> this is getting recorded, right? <laughs> School board members often have to make difficult choices about programs given limited budgets and resources. What are your top three priorities for maintaining a balanced budget while meeting the district's mission of serving all learners? Good question. And I think that um, before I go any further, I, uh, when, when I served on this board before, I was told by a very wise person um, as it relates to those questions that as long as the decisions you're making benefits, you feel at the end of the day, the decisions you made benefited the kids in the district, you can you can sleep better that night. And I, any decision that I made at that time um, is covered under that prism. I felt that the decisions that were made were made um, based on what was uh, best for kids and all kids. Um, that's an easy, easy thing to say, but not as easy a, a thing to do for those that are on the board now and those out there that have served on the board. I think there are fundamental issues as board members we need to take care of. That's the safety and security of our children. That is preparing our kids for life after high school, whether it's uh, college or career ready. And it's also creating citizens uh, uh, in this community, in this state, that we at South St. Paul can be proud of. Yeah, I would share some of those uh, those same priorities. Um, to list my top three, I go back to the two that I mentioned in my previous answer. The first is making sure that we are giving a quality education to every student, and that means meeting them at their level and not at the, at the, the group level. Um, so that has to be a top priority to make sure that we're, we're doing that and continuing the efforts to get to the kids at their level. Um, the other item is uh, school safety. Uh, that's obviously paramount and um, a very high priority. And the, the career readiness. Um, but, you know, college isn't for everyone. We, we're hearing that more and more now. And what we're doing is not only preparing the kids for college that, that are going that route, but coming up with other career choices for uh, the kids that perhaps want to go into a trade or something like that and we're reaching out to the area businesses and forming partnerships with them to provide those opportunities for them so that they can get internships and get into the businesses get some experience with those trades so that when they get out of the school they've got a leg up and can be stepping right into the to that field so those are the three things you know the quality education the career readiness and the safety of the schools Well, I believe that a good district depends on having a good staff, and that you can't have good quality education without good quality teachers in the classroom, paraprofessionals in the classroom, you know, lunch ladies serving lunch, or lunch distributors if we're going to be 
gender neutral. Um, and so I would prioritize, you know, lower class sizes, making sure that in this tight economy that workers want to work for South St. Paul. And I think that the welcoming nature of that comes from the board and comes from the type of contracts we're able to ratify and the types of relationships we're able to build with our staff and our various buildings. I also think taking care of our youngest learners is a high priority, whether that's, again, you know, our preschool learners or ACFE learners um, into our lower elementary school, because if they start off on a good foundation, there are many kind of easier situations to go you know, into the future. So concentrating on, on the, the smallest learners. Um, and again, it also goes back, as they previously said, to safety to making sure that all of our students not only feel safe in their school, feel welcome in their school, but that also, I think, stems down from your staff. If your staff make your children feel safe and welcome and loved in the classroom, then I think many other problems can help solve themselves. Uh, yes, the first thing that comes to my mind regarding the budget is our board has policies that we follow, and it's regarding our fund balance. We, are, we have a number that we've set. The board can adjust it if necessary, but we base our decisions as best we can on that budgetary allotment. Another thing that I'm so proud of with this district, that it is for all students. We are an IB 12, K-12 district. One of the proudest moments that I can recall on my tenure on the board is the day that we became the first in Minnesota IB K-12 district. I remember being at the on the field at Lincoln Center with past Superintendent Hemenover as we had a ceremony, balloon lifting and some speeches and the kids were there. So for me, being a K-12 IB district is so important. I have a nephew with special needs and the IB program, he could do that. He excelled doing IB projects. And for me, it was so touching like I said, as, as a family member, that we are serving all of our students, from the brightest to those with special needs. And also with our, our regarding kind of budgetary items, also with our collaborations that we do with other districts, mostly in Grove and West St. Paul. Um, we have a large variety of things that we do collaborative, collaboratively, our health and safety, and several other things that I'll try and talk to you about later. Thank you. Um, I feel this question is way too general for me to make judgments about priorities. And I think if it were more specific, it would take the entire school board to solve the problem. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you my three priorities. Number one, of course, are the children. Number two is balancing a budget. And number three, but not last, are the children. So I think the way I would frame my um, response to this is that I think my top priority would be taking a developmental lens on any decision we make. So for example, when the decision was made to bring um, all day kindergarten and now preschool into the building, what is the developmental lens that we need to take on that? Sometimes I hear rhetoric that that's great because now we can get started on reading and math earlier and close the achievement gap. What's really going to close the achievement gap is by creating a play-centered um, you know, classroom environment that children are able to be four and five and come in and learn through play. Um, and that's going to get them used to a, a setting where they love being, where they want to respect the teachers, where they look to the adults for guidance um, and care, rather than this place where they're kind of told to be six-year-olds when they're four, or eight-year-olds when they're six, or ten-year-olds when they're six. So that developmental, and the same thing goes with safety. Um, safety comes through relationships, not through security guards or through um, metal detectors. And I don't think we're talking about that here, but I've been in enough urban schools where it's a slip, you know, I don't like the term slippery slope, but it's, it's dangerous to tar start talking about safety um, without talking about what is the school climate factor behind that and what are the relationships that are being built so that we know that issues are surfacing because kids are talking to each other and kids are talking to adults and we know how to you know find uh, where we need to intervene well what are my 
top priority, of course, is safety, and not just physical safety, but mental safety. Our children, we need to be able to have the trained staff that needs to allow the children to feel safe enough to come and talk to them. Um, the re I bring this up, my son, he plays football, their show choir, he came home last week because the teacher didn't notice there was something wrong. To me, that's a safety issue that needs to be addressed. Um, I do feel our children, of course, are number one, whether it's inside the school, at the sports, anytime. They do need to have that safety feeling within themselves, not only just visual. Um, I, I feel the budget, you know, there, there's wiggle room as shown with that grant that we were just granted. I mean, that's an amazing achievement for South St. Paul to get. And I think we can do great things with that and a lot of good training for our students and the teachers. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, my top priorities are uh, understanding that every year things are going to change. That with kids you can't plan, with schools you can't plan, everything happens um, not ever in a vacuum. And so to be able to say, oh, you know, here is our 10-year budget, that would be great. That would be so <coughs> wonderful. But when you're working with people, it often doesn't work out that way. So for there to be uh, flexibility in understanding what, um, what the priorities are in the budget, that would be really great to have that, that uh, as a priority. The second thing is mental health. And I agree with you down at the end that, um, you know, days of old, mental health didn't have a place in our schools. And times have changed, and here we are where if you want to have healthy schools, if you want to have happy learners, um, if you want to make those, those cutoffs and grades and um, have productive citizens, you have to start in the school and have great mental health. And, and if that means um, more programs, if that means more school counselors, and I know that we, we were able to get some, um, you know, whatever it is, that that should be a priority when we're thinking about the budget. Um, and then lastly, I love the IB program. I was an IB student myself. But I believe that it incorporates all different modes and mediums of, of learning, technology, hands-on, um, having speakers, and that that is the best thing for kids. So to continue that as a priority. I guess where I would start would be to say that um, I commonly use the phrase that we all do better when we all do better. Education uh, is not well, I'll say that I'm not a small woman. I don't believe that uh, one size fits all uh, generally fits uh, any situation. And uh, that's true of education too. Um, we're not, uh, you know, we're not able to make sure that every kid's need is met if we're not looking at it as a situation that is not homogenous. And that we have to make sure that we're meeting kids where they're at and that uh, when we're dealing with a budget that is, uh, our general fund budget was in an excess of $42 million. When we're dealing with over 3,000 students in our buildings. When we have educators numbering well over 500. Um, and when I say educators, I mean uh, teachers, custodians, cooks, and uh, administrators. That we're making sure that our budgetary decisions, uh, that we're making those, that we're making sure that we're not harming any of the people that we are you know here to help and to protect so uh, while that's a priority we also have to make sure that we're prioritizing our community members as well and that we're treating them fairly and that we're looking for opportunities to make sure that they are being treated equitably at the state level and uh, so I think that those are the ways that I you know tend to make sure that my top three are uh, looked at all the time are we making sure that everyone is doing better and are we making sure that our community is being uh, treated fairly? Thank you all for answering that question. We have one more general question for all of you. Again, 90 seconds is the time limit. We're going to begin with Chris. This question is a two-part question. What do you see as the biggest success of South St. Paul Public Schools? And what is the biggest challenge, in your opinion? 
Well, the success on, on a long-term basis for, for years has been the, the quality of the education. I mean, I, we moved here almost 30 years ago, and that was something we heard from everyone, is that the schools are really good here. And that's been what we have found as well with our two children. Um, it's, it's, uh, it was certainly our experience that they were well-trained, they're well-educated for what their next step was. And uh, I, you know, now getting in as a school board member and seeing everything that needs to balance to get to that point, you know, for the quality of the education, you know, with the IB and the, the budgetary constraints, I maybe mean, we don't have the, the revenue streams that some of the larger districts do. You know, there's a lot of balancing that goes on. And for that to go on and still come out with the, the quality that we're getting, that's clearly uh, the, the success that I see of the schools. Um, the biggest challenge is, is going to be, I would say, financial. Um, the, we, for years, we've been cutting the budget every single year. Well, it, it's pretty easy to see that that's going to, to really impact the, the future of the schools. And so that's got to be, you know, through equalization, working with the legislature, there are ideas we need to brainstorm those things and make sure that we're keeping the, the financial solidity of the, uh, the district. I would say the biggest success of the school district is that people still want to be involved in the school district, that they still um, value the, the education that their students are getting, that when new families move in, they want to be involved in the schools, and I think that's success. Like, when you walk around this community, people are proud of their school, they're proud of the teachers that are able to to benefit their children. And so I think that's success for any community is when people really value the school that is in their community. I think the biggest challenge for, their, for this district, and I think a slightly different track from the financial challenges that we all know and that I've addressed that need to be you know, fixed on a more macro level at the state, at the state is, is overcrowding. I mean, we saw it when we had to move the sixth graders into the high school and we had to build wings onto various schools. I can tell you, I have a bunch of three-year-olds who live on my street. They're going to get older. They're going to enter into our school system. I was a substitute teacher, actually, in the school district. They have a, um, an education license. I was able to be a substitute teacher in the district, and I was able to see Definitely, you know, the overcrowding, the, you know, students, you know, class sizes being too large, and just that our schools are physically bursting with all the new families that want to move into our community. And so that's going to be something we need to take seriously um, as we move forward. I'd like to start with, with the challenges that I feel that we face. And I believe the first one is funding, whether it's from the state capital with equity funding, um, and also with regarding special education funding under the federal government. The federal government has failed to live up to what they promised us over the years with their funding, and we need, we need to work with our legislature to get that funding back. I personally talked to a couple candidates that are running for national offices, and that was the one thing that I stressed. You need to fix special education funding for school districts, because that alone could make a great impact on our budget giving us the proper funding. And the thing that I, I'm actually most proud of right now is our college and career readiness programs. For those of you that may not be familiar with it, this is one of the consortiums that we are working with in the Grove and West St. Paul in. Uh, we, we have students that currently can follow two tracks if interested. The first one is attending a medical careers track. We are proud to be aligned with TRIA Orthopedics, which is right out uh, in, in the uh, Invergrove, West St. Paul area at the Vikings Center, where students can go there and learn about medical fields. We have a heavy duty truck program where students are interested in any type of that. They can search out those uh, programs through this program, um, Career and College Readiness. And so we look forward to expanding that program as we are already looking at possibly a third track through that program. So college and career readiness, I'm very proud of that. <laughs> well, I think the thing that I haven't heard that I'm the most proud of in this community 
Um, each day I go for a walk around Bensfield and Park Lane because I live across from the Lincoln Center. And going through my head today, which usually there isn't much, but today there was. And I was so proud of the fact, when I went to school, I never got to school thinking, I wonder if any of these kids had breakfast. And at lunchtime, I never looked around to see if everybody was eating. But you know what? I'm proud to know that the kids in this town are being fed. And that once a month, there's a track comes, and the parents can pick up groceries for home. So I think that's a, a big priority, and it's one thing I'm very, very proud of, uh, as far as saying I'm from South St. Paul. And, and the other thing, our biggest challenge, I agree with Wendy and Chris, we, we don't have enough money. We have to, you know, work some type of magic to keep things going, because we're, we're in the right direction. But something's got to happen, and I, I don't have the answer for that. So I would agree that um, the biggest success is the success of our academic programs. Um, there's lots to choose from and lots of tracks to go on. And the IB, I think in particular, being the first uh, K-12 IB district, is really um, an amazing accomplishment and really is something that we can lean into rather than chasing the next best thing in whole school you know, culture shifts or climate changes or that kind of thing to really, you know, those IB learning profiles really provide the grounding that we need if we continue to build them in terms of creating that relational learning climate. I think the challenge is, is you know, is going to be given the financial um, difficulties is around equity and the new families, um, you know, that are, what our population looks like now. I, I think about a couple of families that I know who, have not, who are not enrolling in the district because there isn't, for example, um, a Spanish immersion um, program or a better opportunity to really develop those additional language skills um, that they might already be bringing from home. So how are we seeing every child as bringing all sorts of assets that may have looked different than some of the assets um, that children 25 years ago have brought, but really um, leaning into those assets and developing those 21st century um, leaders that you know many of them are going to need to be bilingual, and that needs to start in elementary school and, and go all the way up. So. Well, I believe one of our biggest challenges is the number of children we have in each school. Um, I look at the secondary school and you see these little sixth graders that are three feet tall next to these six foot seniors and it's scary. Um, I, I don't believe that's any kind of success at all. Um, that's a huge challenge. You've got the fear and you've got these little kids in there that just don't know where to grow. I, I think at, on the school board, that's something that really needs to be tackled. Um, I know that's a financial issue too. Um, but then you see the other side, the success. 30 years ago, I graduated from South St. Paul. Within that 30 years, there has been so many changes and the education has just loomed. Uh, we have the IB, we have the career paths, everything, and it's, it's amazing to see our children grow with that. Um, you know, I think about what South St. Paul can do with a little bit. Um, if you've ever been to a booyah, you know that that pot is never ending and it can feed the whole town. And I think about the funding. There are some, absolutely, some long-term issues that need to be um, accounted for. But I, I, when I think about success, I think about the, the programs that we've built already with just that little bit. So um, down the road, when our legislators get back on board with us and start to listen, I, I can only imagine um, what we'll do with that. Uh, as, a, as an opportunity, you know, I, I agree um, that we want to make sure that we're serving all kids and providing services for all kids. I, I keep, you know, I'm kind of biased with the mental health thing, but I keep going back to mental health services. You know, I've talked to some principals, I've talked to some teachers, I've even talked to some teenagers and kids. Um, and that's the thing that they that was a hot topic. They keep bringing up, you know, we, we want to make sure, we'll learn better when we feel better. Um, and so how are we making sure that uh, the services are enough for our kids? Um, yeah, opportunity, success, thanks. 
Thank you. I think historically South St. Paul has been a community of people that have uh, known firsthand how to do a lot with very little. And um, you know, if you ever attend any of our events or you know maybe some of our Hall of Fame kids or you know who are now in their adulthood and you know there's a, a common refrain about uh, you know how they came from families that didn't have a whole lot maybe their parents didn't graduate from high school and what they were able to go on and do um, after achieving their education here and I think it's it speaks loudly to what we're able to do here for our kids and families um, obviously, we've all agreed that uh, funding will continue to be a problem here, and at the state level, they make that decision for us that the onus will be on our property, um, our property owners here in our community. Frankly, I don't think it's fair that the fact that we don't have a Chick-fil-A means that our elderly people have to pay more uh, with regards to our levies and referendums to help support our schools. It's not fair, and um, I'd like to see that change. As far as successes, while many people will say that we continue to have an achievement gap and that shouldn't be minimized, I do believe that. Um, if you go into our buildings every day, you'll see that kids are making strides and achievement is happening. Uh, you might not just necessarily see that every day or read about it in the paper. Um, other successes, we continue to have a high rate of graduates every year and I think that too lends to a lot of the success that we're able to offer our kids here. I'm going to take this question together because I think they're related. And those of us, and I, and I look through the audience uh, and see the relative um, age of everyone, and I know that when we, and when we were kids in the schools, teachers taught. There's more expected of our teachers today. Teachers are police officers, teachers are social care workers, teachers are doctors, teachers are nurses. And in order to really attack the, one of the major challenges of education, it needs to be a whole solution. We need a better jobs program. We need an immigration uh, plan nationally. We need um, affordable housing. We need to stop cutting social services. If you can do those things outside of the education system, it's gonna absolutely help the, help the schools. The success of that is while teachers are different now when they were then, our teachers in South St. Paul are that and they're doing it effectively. They are police officers, they are nurses, they are doctors, they are social care workers, they are clergy, you name it, and our teachers are doing it, and that is, I think, one of the largest successes here in South St. Paul. Um, I'll add the funding because I think it needs to be touched on as well. Um, we're, the school districts are, are um, the revenue is given to school districts based on per pupil funding. It's starting to decrease. We need to figure out why and figure out how we can get that turned around so that our school um, revenues don't continue to drop. I quote, uh, figured out a way to equalize our funding because in South St. Paul, kids are being discriminated against because they are not being uh, funded like our neighbors are, and that needs to change too. Thanks. All right, thank you so much for answering those questions. Before we begin the lightning round, I just wanted to remind the audience that if you have any questions for the candidates, um, we do have the note cards and pens, if you would write down your questions, and Susan will come around and pick them up. I would be happy to pose those questions to the candidates after the lightning round. So now the lightning round is uh, one question per candidate. I will randomly choose a question that is in this little pot here. We will begin with Monica. And you get one minute to answer each of the lightning round questions. All right, Monica, what do you believe are the two to three defining characteristics of a high functioning school board? So the first characteristic is communication, because if you're not communicating well, then you're not able to work together to solve whatever goal or task that you have ahead of you. Um, I think teamwork would be the next one, because again, if you're not communicating and you're not working together, then you're not gonna be very successful. And then I would say um, respect for various viewpoints would be the other characteristic of a high functioning board, of being able to have different points of view and then agreeing in the end to what 
the best solution is, and that acknowledging that we are the board is a democracy, and just like any democracy, um, it's not going to always be a unanimous decision. But hopefully, everyone feels heard, everyone feels understood, and everyone can agree to move forward after a vote has been taken. Thank you, Monica. Wendy, your question is, what is your definition of personalized learning and how should personalized learning be implemented in South St. Paul Public Schools? Well, as you know, each student is different. We all come from different backgrounds, different lifestyles, different experiences. Individualized learning should focus on that student's strengths. What does that student bring? Is he a good reader? Is he a good math student? Are they, are they good at, uh, at figuring things out? Are, are they leaders? Are they good listeners? There's a lot of different things that individualized learning involves. So if that student surpasses an arithmetic, if he's having trouble with reading, maybe he can figure out different types of word problems. Or just, or just the opposite situation too. If he's having a little trouble with math, doing division the long way, maybe we can individualize the education of that student to maybe try and do a little more reading problems, figuring out his math. So, and our teachers are really good at grouping kids so that they know their their situations and they can help each student to their best ability. Thank you, Wendy. Phil, your question was written for you, I think. <laughs> South St. Paul has a strong history and tradition with many of its graduates returning to the community to raise their own children. What is the role of the school board in upholding the traditions and successes of the past with the needs of today's learners and tomorrow's workforce? <laughs> um, let's go over that one more time, Joanna. It's I, a long one now. <laughs> I can always choose a different one if you want. Let me click this there. South St. Paul has a strong history and a tradition, and many uh, of the graduates come back to the community to raise their own children. What is the role of the school board in upholding those traditions and successes of the past while also looking forward to the needs of today's children and learners and for tomorrow's workforce? Um, I really don't think that the school board has any obligation to uphold tradition. I think the school board's focus should be in moving one direction and then forward. And to do that, um, we don't forget history but we don't incorporate it in our forward movement. That's a suitable answer for everybody. And I have some more seconds banked up too. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. All right, Kara. Kara, sorry. As the district has shared for several years, Residents of South St. Paul pay two to three times more in local property taxes to raise the same amount of school revenue as residents of another district. What is the role of the school board in advancing referendum equalization to help level the playing field between school districts? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of those things that our school board and our school district leadership has, you know, would be one of the successes that we could also, also point to in terms of being a consistent voice with our local representatives, as well as the um, Department of Education and the, the governor um, around raising awareness and letting them know that, as somebody up here said, that is affecting our children, our young people, and, our, uh, and the tax base that we have. So I think it is absolutely to continue raising that awareness. Um, and then, you know, when you think about so it's, it's raising the awareness of the inequity, but it's also raising the awareness of, of what happens, right? And so how are our students suffering and how are our taxpayers suffering? Um, and, and making sure those stories are out there and that we can give really salient um, 
examples of what's going on and what's not going on in our um, classrooms and in our buildings um, because of the inequity in the financing structure. Thank you. Catherine, your question is, the district has a history of securing partnerships with other schools, municipalities, and organizations. What additional partnerships do you think the district should pursue in order to best meet its mission and vision? Well, I, I would I have to say that merging some of our career paths together would help out both all districts that would be involved, um, being able to be open to um, providing education to both sides. Um, I, d I think that having an open system and being able to understand what everyone is looking for for their students and being willing to have an openness to share if they have something more share it with us same with us if we have that education or that knowledge we'll share with them but i think being able to show it as one district and that we're all looking for the future of our children thank you linda your question is if elected, what key strategies would you employ to ensure the school board is able to function effectively as a group while also honoring the individual voices of its members? Oh, I think this relates to the question that was said earlier um, with Monica. And I, I think that um, teamwork, you know, South St. Paul has a, has a great history of teamwork. Um, not just in South St. Paul, but uh, across the school board. I've been attending a lot of the meetings and been able to see the dynamics um, that have been happening. And I think that respect of all points of view um, is absolutely necessary to uh, continue on with the work that has been done. Um, I also think that um, a flexibility of thought, diversity of thought was uh, another topic that was brought up understanding that um, even though we may not agree that we have one umbrella one goal um, and that that's what we're striving for thank you <clears throat> christy your question is what is the role of the school board in addressing the mental health and wellness of its students Given that this is a hot topic, I think, of late, um, not only in our community, but uh, communities throughout the United States and beyond, um, I think that we must be mindful that our policy that we are putting in place is um, looking at uh, things surrounding mental health or access to mental health services, uh, that we are looking through that lens and um, making sure that we are putting those policies in place so that they're, you know, uh, placing value on those services that we're able to offer and that we are looking for opportunities for those services outside of our buildings. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing that we could do. Thank you. Anne, what is your view on the role of technology in advancing learning for students? Good question, because it's very relevant. And I think it's something that um, uh, has been addressed here on how South St. Paul has always in the past uh, does so much with so little. And and I also think that it is um, uh, topical, only because it was just recently discussed at the board level uh, last week. I think that, um, as, as a board, and, and I look down here and there are a, a lot of um, excellent opinions and a lot of educated people up here. Um, with the exception of Monica, there are no teachers up here. One thing as a, as a board member, which we can and, and do and should do, um, is rely on uh, best practices. And those best practices are taught back and told to us by the administrators and the staff that's, that's charged to do that, to report back to us. 
and uh, technology would be incorporated and what are best practices, what works for kids, what, what, what doesn't work for kids and how can we move it forward. Thank you. And Chris, finally. What do you think is most important to improving student achievement? I think the relationship between the teachers and the students. Um, part of that is, you know, the, as I've talked about, you know, meeting them at their level. That's, you know, if we have a student that is being taught at a level that they don't understand or perhaps they're beyond the, that level, it, it's, it's not going to really engage them in their learning. And that's got to be the priority. Once the, the student is engaged in the learning, they're going to succeed much more than don't. Um, so that's going to be the, the most important thing. Um, and that's, that would be the, the thing that I would be looking for. Um, again, it's a real challenge. It's a difficult thing for the teachers to do. I think our teachers are doing a fabulous job with the tools that they're learning and practicing now and that they will, uh, they will get better at and that's going to meet that goal for the South St. Paul students. Thank you. I have received several questions from the audience members. Um, the audience questions, uh, I'm not sure about how long they get. Do you get one minute to answer? Same time, one minute. Um, just let me look through this real quick. Um, since the lightning round started with Monica, then we'll start with Wendy. You'll be the first person to answer these questions, but everyone gets a chance to answer. It has been said that today's South St. Paul Board is a governing board, not a managerial board of education. Do you agree, and what does that mean to you as a potential board member? Yes, we are a governance board. As a governance board, we believe it is our job to give a lot of the, the administration policy work to the people that should be doing that work. It is the board's responsibility. We hire the superintendent, and as our superintendent, he is given the authority to pass along directives, instructions, <laughs> requirements, necessities to his building principals. The building principals, it's their responsibility to pass it on to their staff members. So we are a governance body as compared to being in the, in the nitpicky little things as a board member, it is not our job to be nitpicking different things. We give that authority to our administration whom that we hire and, and give them that prowess that they can do the best job for their buildings and for their staff and students. And we're proud of that fact. Am yeah. I supposed to comment on this? Everybody has a chance to answer the same question, so I can certainly repeat the question. Um, no, I'm, I'm aware of the question, Very but I'm, I'm just thinking I'm a candidate for the school board. I'm not on the school board, and I don't have the ability to answer that question, so my answer is going to be no comment. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end it said, do you agree with that it's a governance and a manager, right? So I don't think any of us get to disagree. Like, I think that's the statute, you know, the, um, the board is a governance board and we don't get to come in and say, I want to turn it into a managerial board. And I, don't, I hope that none of us are coming in with that perspective. So I do agree with that. And I think that what that means is that it's absolutely at the policy and budgetary level. Um, and, you know, we need to think about what the practice and management implications of those decisions are, but it's certainly not our uh, responsibility to be managing um, what the decisions that are made at that level, so. I would also agree that we do not do the micromanaging or the managing at all. Um, that's delegated. We're voted in by the people and they, trust us to do that for them. So I, I believe, yes, we are governed. I agree, I think it's our job as a board um, to come in and be curious, to ask questions, to wonder, um, to, to um, not 
throw a wrench in anything, but to make sure that we are working together with all of the experiences that are on the board to make sure that everything has been thought of. Um, so I absolutely agree with what's been said. I think that it's important to remember that uh, we're very fortunate with the administration that we do have in our community. Um, we have, I think, a top-notch administrative team at our district office. We are led by uh, great staff in our buildings. Um, I think it would be far be it from us to manage how they do their job and the work that they're doing. Um, and it is our responsibility to make sure that we are maintaining governance at all times. That doesn't mean that sometimes but we're not still learning on what governing should look like or you know what that impacts and um, so as a board we continue to keep on, on our education so that we make sure that we are maintaining uh, strong governance at all times uh, that being said we're also representative of our constituents which means that we need to be available to those of you who are putting us in, into our offices and uh, in order to do that, we still have to make sure that we're keeping that fine balance of, you know, maintaining our position in governance and uh, engaging with our, our voters in a way that is respectful. School board hires the superintendent, approves a budget, sets policies, and listens to their constituents. There should be no deviation from that. This is good board work. I think we have a consensus on here. So, so it's well done, everyone. That's what has been said is absolutely true. We work in governance, um, and that really just comes down to the chain of command. You know, we do hire the superintendent. It's his responsibility to fill out the staff and to you know make the assignments and, and make sure that that everything is being done the way he wants it to be done. And for us to get in and undermine that process would just be a, a, a terrible thing. That doesn't mean that as school board members, we don't continue to learn. You know, we also are lifelong learners along with the staff and the students that we're, we're really together. There's a lot to learn about, uh, about board work. And so we need to do that. We need to ask questions. We need to continually watch what is going on in the district and ask questions about that. You know, we need to be on top of, of everything that's going on, but we don't want to get down to the point where we're trying to make decisions for the, for the school district. Well, once again, not to sound like a broken record, but I would generally agree that, yes, the board sets policy, the board does hire the administration um, and oversees the budgets and things that flow, the flow downwards. I would say the only place where I would say that the board does a little bit of managing would be in the ratification of the collective bargaining agreements and in making sure that every term of those collective bargaining agreements is being agreed to by both sides and is being fairly executed by both sides. And I would want to know that there is um, labor peace within our within our school district because if there wasn't, then I think that would create a whole bunch of problems um, within our community that perhaps would involve board involvement. Thank you. We have one other question from the audience. And we're going to start with Bill. Are you familiar with the ACEs study, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, and the effects of these experiences on children and adults? What do you think our district needs to do to address the growing number of students and teachers affected by trauma? <laughs> I think we need to keep doing what we are doing. This isn't uh, my school district any longer, nor is it my son's. It's my grandchildren's now. And um, we have some pretty good programs in place. Um, I think somebody said we here said that we need our teachers to be uh, policemen and doctors and nurse, or nurses and, and no, we need our teachers to teach and that's what we do in this program. We have designated policemen, we have designated nurses um, and I think we need to continue to do that and is everything going to work? No. But, you know, if you can do one thing and you do it wrong, you're not wrong. So uh, we'll continue to make our mistakes and learn from them and continue to hopefully go on from there and try new programs. 15 seconds, thank you. 
Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm really familiar with the ASL study. Um, you know, and, and knowing that the more childhood, the, the more trauma that happens in childhood, the harder it is to, or the more likely you're going to end up in an unhealthy, unhealthy situation as adults. So whether that's you're more likely to have heart disease, or you're more likely to have diabetes, or you're more likely to have gone through a divorce as an adult, or right. So that that trauma in childhood impacts your trajectory for the rest of your life. And that what schools can do about that is, you know, as, as Chris said, we're lifelong learners and our society is a lifelong learner and we continue to evolve and understand what are the impacts of childhood traumas and how do schools become trauma informed. And so what it means is we do a better job of checking in with young people when they come in and saying, how are you today? Not why won't you still sit still? And when we ask sixth graders to handle a middle school environment, we're, we're saying, what are the potential triggers to having to go through a um, transition continually through the day? And these can be trigger, trauma triggering, um, and so we need to know how to respond to that. I personally am not, um, do not have any knowledge of this study, um, but as a trauma, I do have knowledge. I believe that with training and openness and having just the open door policies with our, our students and our staffs equally, um, I think we would be able to overcome any kind of barriers that the children have with the trauma. Um, the training again, that goes back to the financial issue, um, whether we can afford it, I think we can, but the training on any kind of developmental issues is something that we definitely need. I too am very um, aware of this study. Uh, I believe that when it comes to the school district, we can't expect teachers to be therapists, but we do know that teachers have therapeutic skills. So we can't dismiss that. I think what gets, um, where we get caught is that teachers see everything. They know exactly what's happening in their classrooms, but what do they do? Where do they send these kids? So to make sure that um, they're understanding trauma, they're understanding, they have a great awareness of it, um, and that they know what to do after they realize that, that folks, or that children are, are experiencing trauma. Um, where can we send them? And so that, that to me seems to be the crux of the problem. Um, is not expecting them to, to take care of the issue, but how do we direct them to the places that can help? I'm also aware of the study, and um, uh, it's, it's an awful lot to unpack in, in one you know, minute response, but I would say if you were to look at, uh, if, if you take every student and you start counting off some of the trauma points that they may have been experiencing in their home life, they, while many people feel like South St. Paul has remained the same or would like for it to remain the same, it's not, nor the, our country's not the same. We have students that come to us who are hungry when they come to school, whose parents are incarcerated, who are homeless, um, and yet they're to come to school and they expected to line up and to do school well, and, and uh, the teachers are expected to you know, know how to uh, fix all of their needs. And it's, uh, it's a daunting challenge, but I do believe that our educators are becoming more and more knowledgeable about uh, how trauma is affecting their students, and that we are finding ways to help uh, alleviate some of those issues as best as we can at the district level. So I'm not totally familiar with the study, but I think what um, this is a good indication of how it works in a boardroom because you're going to have seven people from uh, different backgrounds, different professions, different um, uh, different mindsets, and this is exactly what happens when you're in a board meeting where you will have professionals, you know, or you will have people that are familiar with this that brings the information to you, and that's what a good board member does is absorbs that knowledge applies that knowledge to their own and uses that based uh, along with the best practices recommendations from the administrators to um, move, a, uh, move a path forward. Yes, this is one of those one of those things that needs to be done. It is not traditionally the role of the school 
um, like feeding the kids and making sure that they have clothing and, and, and those sorts of things. It, but if the schools don't do it, it may not get done. So we take on that responsibility. Um, this is one of those lifelong learning topics and we will have people that have ideas on how to support the main thing is we need to support those, those kids and we can do that through you know the, the teachers they're going to see what's what's going on um, we have brought counselors into the schools so there's there is a, a support network and as we learn continue to learn more about it those those supports will increase and that's part of the role of the school board again is to keep learning about that topic what more can we do where can we pull in the resources or should we be directing them to resources outside of the district? It's, uh, it's just the, the, the main thing is that we support those kids. I'm also not familiar with this particular study, but I know when I was a student teacher in Northeast Minneapolis, I had students who came to school every day who I was, as a student teacher, the most constant thing in their life. Like they didn't know where they were sleeping that night. They didn't know when they were going to be eat, where they'd be eating dinner. And many of them were language, English language learners. So learning seventh grade history, not high on their agenda um, for what they wanted to do. But I knew that I could be there as a resource. I knew that I could be there as someone who cared about them, as a constant in their life. And so working, again, it goes back to relationships, working with children who have suffered with trauma, I think just having the, um, the humanity to work with them where they are, to have the resources to refer them to when you've gone beyond your ability, and to just have um, just the compassion to, again, meet people where they're at and what skills are necessary for, for them. I guess I am not familiar with that study either. However, I am familiar with the great strides that we have made as a district for our families in a lot of trauma areas. Uh, like Mr. Aaron had said, our kids can have free breakfast now. We have made great strides with our families, letting them know that if, if they qualify for free and reduced lunch, that those children will be getting their lunches and that would be a benefit to the family for not having to put out extra money for lunches for their, their student each day. We have extra counselors now in our buildings. We have 360 communities in our buildings doing some counseling. We have the Second Harvest Food Bank coming into each of our buildings every month and giving food to our families. So we are making great, great strides. And I see it having grown up right across the street from this school you can always tell when school's going to start in the fall in august the kids are back on the playground they're excited to get back they like being here they feel safe and that's the one thing that we can do for kids is to make them feel safe thank you so much for answering those audience questions in the interest of time we do need to move to our final question uh, each candidate gets one minute to answer this question, and we will begin with Kara. If elected, how would you ensure engagement of all parents and get effective feedback and input from them to inform your work as a school board member? Um, effective engagement of all parents, I think, is, you know, the ideal that we all aim for and probably not something we'll um, attain. I think effective engagement in education is something that all parents are doing, whether they're gonna engage with me or not in the school board, it might be a different, but I think that's, you know, the government's for, governance versus managerial question, right? Is what are the policies and budgetary foundational pieces that we're setting up so that our schools can do excellent family engagement work. I think family engagement is one of those holy grails of education and truly understanding what is family engagement from different um, cultural perspectives, as well as how are we honoring kind of the, you know, the work that families have to do to provide the basic needs for their kids and, and allowing them to engage in their students' education at the best level they have because fundamentally we all have to come at it with the, pre um, the belief that every parent wants what's best for their kids and we can all work together to um, have that same mindset. 
Well, I would begin most likely with better transparency with the parents and the students. Um, I think that open communication, allowing them to have information as much as possible without breaking any kind of privacy. Um, but I, I would like to see some kind of forums um, or focus groups, not only for the parents, but also for the students. Make it a, a volunteer effort. Um, that allows them, that empowers them, that gives them the information, that gives us the information of what they want. And that's the most important thing that we're here for. Um, I really see this as, a, as another hot topic. I know that a few of us were talking about it even before the forum began. Um, I also know that it's, it's something that the current school board is assessing right now, is how to be more engaged with the community. Um, for me, it's really being visible. Do the community members, do parents know who the school board people are? Um, I'd love to see this room filled up, right? And, and why isn't it filled? What, what else can we do? What other meetings can we use to make sure that folks know who these people are? Um, the other thing is, you know, we were talking about um, how do we stay visible with um, groups that, that normally we don't see? And the, the answer was we need to go to them. How do we get invited to groups um, that are meeting already? You know, we know that there are, there's a Spanish speaking group. Um, I know that Kara speaks Spanish, I speak Spanish, um, but thinking out of the box and having a, a Spanish translator coming with us so that we can introduce ourselves. You know, making sure that we are approaching um, and, and being approachable. Thank you. I like to think of my role as a relationship builder and I hope that I've been successful in, in that avenue uh, during my four years so far. Um, I think that it's important um, that we find ourselves in positions where we can reach as many people as we possibly can. And to that end, I um, was able to get onto committees that helped me achieve that, such as the Education Foundation and the South Bay Paul Open. And in the, we now have a public engagement committee that we're trying to look for ways that we can continue to increase our visibility and to engage all of our families and students and teachers. Um, I think that so far that given the number of people that do reach out to me, I, I feel that uh, continuing to be approachable in uh, times when people maybe don't feel comfortable seeking out someone, um, I think that uh, that has helped me better my role as a school board member and I'm happy that I can fill that role. At a risk of repeating everything that um, has been repeated up here, um, Linda said something really important because I think when you hold a forum like that, if we hold a forum like this at a different school um, on a different night, we'll probably see a lot of the same faces in here. And it is true that 20% of the people are involved and 80% um, and of the work. So um, to that, I think Linda brings up a good point is we need to go to where they are. We need to be a part of their, of their world. Um, and then another thing that's not mentioned here, and, and I think that a lot of times people in generally think they need to reinvent the, way, reinvent the wheel. Who does it? Who does community engagement really good? What districts do it? How do they do it? What tactics do they use um, to engage their community? And um, let's figure out a way that we can replicate that here. Uh, a couple of different ways, and both of them just revolve around communication and getting in front of the parents. And really, I would, as some people have here, I would extend that to really the whole community and not just parents. Um, we can get out in front of them, meet them in, in their own groups. You know, we do a, a state of the district uh, presentation every year now that is really intended to broadcast out to the community, hey, here's what we are, here's what we're doing, here's where we stand, here's what we've accomplished. You know, what, what else do you want to ask us? And a, another piece of it is to not only have us get out there, but to invite them into the schools. Uh, a program that's just starting up next week is the Parents in Action program, where middle school parents can sign up for a six night uh, sessions, six nights of these sessions, where they come in and they learn about 
what it's like to raise a middle schooler, what it's like to have a middle schooler in the schools and uh, learn how to uh, better improve their, their educational experience. Um, so the, those are the two things that I'm really looking forward to. Obviously, you're never going to get 100% engagement from any community, um, but that always, always is the good, a good goal to have. I think possibly reaching out into other communication styles, reaching out. I know that I've lived in South St. Paul for seven years, and I couldn't tell you who a member of the school board was um, beforehand. Um, so it's about, as you said, engaging people in maybe a, a state of the district, maybe doing some more things on social media or on YouTube or on, you know, do a five minute, here's what's going on in our district and put it on YouTube and try to get it out and maybe more people will see it. I know that currently I read the flyer that comes out from the district every quarter, I believe, um, and that's where I get a majority of my information, and I think if we had other avenues that I could be more informed. Yes, communication, in my view, is a two-way street. It's important for us as board members to reach out to our citizens and just ask them directly, do you have concerns? What would you like us to see us do? Uh, we recently have have hired a communications director. She's doing a great job and she will be getting information out and things that are of urgency to our families right away. And also as a board, we like to participate in community events. You'll see us in the Composure Days Parade. Um, you'll see us at, at different things. And also the invitation to our senior citizens a lot, of them, a lot of the senior citizens in our community don't realize that they can come to community events in, in our activities and our buildings for no charge. They can attend the plays for no charge. Athletic events at no charge. So we encourage that promotion too to get people into our buildings to see how wonderful they are, meet our staff, and give us encouragement as we look forward to growing with our community. I hate to say this, but we got so far off the subject. I need to hear the question again. <laughs> the question was, if elected, how would you ensure engagement of all parents and get effective feedback and input from them to inform your work as a school board member? Okay. Um, I think that the job doesn't belong to the school board. So if I'm elected, I don't see me doing much as far as engagement goes. But I do think we have it in the schools, and I think we call them conferences. And I think if you ask any experienced educator, they'll tell you that the children that are um, um, cooperative and good students, their parents will probably be there. And they'll probably tell you that the kids that are uncooperative and not learning will probably not be there. And I don't know what the percentage is. You'd have to talk to an educator. But we have it. But does it work? I don't know. Thank you. We have reached the end of our candidate forum this evening. I want to thank you, each and every one of you, for coming out here and taking the time to conduct this forum and answer all these great questions um, about your potentially being on the school board. Um, I just want to I want to thank you too for the opportunity for, from promotion of PTA to um, be here and host. I know that I've learned a lot about all of you um, just in this brief time, and I feel like um, I can't speak for the rest of the audience, but I can say that I feel like I can make an educated decision when it comes to vote on November six. Um, I do want to just remind the audience. Um, Vote, vote, vote. <laughs> so important. Um, so just thank you so much uh, and have a great evening.